from the top, I will say this, that uh, I'm not exactly sure what in the world the Lord is doing, but I know that the Lord is doing something. And so we need to pray uh, just in terms of our meeting and the rest. Just pray for patience. Pray that the Lord would continue to sustain us uh, as a body and as believers individually. Um, I think as well, one thing that we can say for sure is that the enemy does not want us starting our study of the book of Revelation. We've already delayed it a week. We, of course, uh, were supposed to start meeting in person today. Here we are on the stream. And so the prince of the power of the air is interfering uh, and giving us some technical difficulties. So all that said, we've got a great study. Let's pray again. We're going to jump in. We're going to start back at the beginning of Revelation chapter 1. I'm sorry to push this and to uh, we'll be finishing late. But if you can stay with us, I think that you'll be encouraged. Uh, I know that I have been. So let's pray. So Father, we uh, pray again, Lord, as we start off, Lord, we pray that your spirit would be our teacher. We pray for open hearts to hear what your spirit would say to us through your word. Lord, we do pray for just these technical difficulties. We thank you for resolving them. And we just pray for a steady stream and the ability just to hear from you, Lord, from your word today. And we thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so Revelation chapter 1. And Revelation certainly is one of the most controversial, it is one of the most discussed, one of the most scrutinized, and one of the most misunderstood books in all of the Bible. And people have been hammering away at this book for thousands of years, and of course their hammers have become dull, and yet the book still remains. And it's simply evidence of the fact that if you hammer on rock long enough, that your hammer is going to wear out. And it's precisely what Jesus promised would happen. In Matthew 24, he said that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And as we study through the book of Revelation, we're going to see both of these things actually happen. We will see that heaven and earth will pass away, but we'll also see that the word of the Lord will indeed remain for all of eternity. And so far from passing away, this book, under centuries of criticism and centuries of misinterpretation, Revelation remains, it is the climax, without question, of the entire Bible. Because it shows us the final fulfillment of the plan and of the purpose of God for the entire universe that he created and in which we live. The book of Revelation is the, the climax of so many different lines of revealed truth that run throughout both the Old and the New Testament. It brings to a, a final conclusion so many of these prophecies that we still see have yet to be finally and fully fulfilled. Essentially, Kind of effectively, what the book of Revelation does is it kind of ties up, if you will, all of those loose ends of the scriptures. So given all of this, right, the, the importance of the book in the scheme of everything that the Lord has revealed to us, given the tendency throughout church history for misunderstanding and, and for misinterpretation, there's a, a fair amount, I think, of some foundational information that is going to be key for us as we start out on this important study, because a careful interpretation of this book, according to careful scriptural principles, that's what's going to prevent us from making common mistakes about the book. And more importantly than that, it's going to get us closer to what it is that the Lord is trying to communicate to us about his heart and about the love he has for each one of us. Now, once we get rolling in the study, we're probably going to study through the book at a clip of about a chapter a week. And yet, this morning, we're going to look at just the first three verses of the first chapter. It's often called the prologue. And as we do look at it, I think you're going to see that it presents really concisely, it presents rather clearly the basic facts that are going to undergird our study of the entire book. It's going to give us the subject, 
the purpose and the method of this book, or, or more accurately, maybe more easily said, it's going to give us the who, the why, and the how of the revelation. And it starts right out here in verse 1 of chapter 1 of Revelation with the who. It simply starts saying the revelation of Jesus Christ. So these first five words give us the subject really of the entire book. It's about Jesus Christ. The word revelation is just a translation of the Greek word apocalypsis. And that simply means an unveiling or a disclosure, right? From this word, we get our English word apocalypse, which unfortunately has kind of come to be a synonym for chaos and for catastrophe. And yet the word itself simply means to uncover or to reveal or to make manifest. It would have been the same word in the ancient world that they would have used uh, to describe the unveiling maybe of a new statue in the public square that was contained under a sheet. They would have said, hey, you know, come on down and join us next Saturday for an apocalypsis. So in this book, what the Holy Spirit is doing is he's simply pulling back the curtain, right? He's removing the cover and he gives us the privilege then of seeing the glorified Jesus Christ in heaven, seeing the fulfillment of his sovereign purposes in the world. So this book literally is the unveiling, it's the disclosure of Jesus Christ. And think about it this way, just in the very same way that the New Testament begins with the gospel accounts that relate to the first coming of Jesus, kind of that unveiling of him as a man in his you know, uh, his glory was veiled by that human body. But now the book of Revelation closes out the New Testament with the description of the second coming of Jesus, right? It's that unveiling of him as God, right? His glory now unveiled. We see all of his power. We see all of his authority. And I think that we need to make this point because this point is the point of the entire book book. It's so important for us because this book is so much more than just some sort of a prophetic program, although it is that. But more importantly, it is a penetratingly focused look at the glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus. It does show us the Antichrist. It does show us God's judgment. It does show us all the calamity that will take place on the earth. It shows us mystery Babylon in such vivid detail. But most of all, it's the revelation, not just of those things, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ to each and every one of us personally and individually. And if we catch everything else in this book, but if we miss the Jesus of this book, then we have missed the entire book of Revelation. You simply can't separate the person from the prophecy because without the person of Jesus, there can be no fulfillment of the prophecy. And that's to say this too, we can't let the intrigue of the prophecy eclipse the importance of the person of Jesus. In chapter 1, we're going to see him as the risen priest king. In chapters 2 and 3, we'll see him examining the churches. Chapters 4 and 5, we're going to see him receiving worship in heaven and receiving the title deed to creation. In chapters 6 through 19, we'll see him judging the world and returning in glory. And then in chapters 20 through 22, we're going to see him reigning in glory and power forever and ever. And notice too, this is the book of Revelation. It's not Revelations. The word is singular and not plural because the subject is singular. The subject is Jesus. It's about revealing him. He is risen. He is returning and he is reigning. And oh, how we each need a fresh revelation of the Lord Jesus. 
I love what Charles Haddon Spurgeon said. He said this, he says, the great fault of many professors of faith is that Christ to them is a character upon paper, certainly more than a myth, but yet a person of the dim past, a historical personage who lived many years ago and did most admirable deeds by which we are saved, but who is far from being a living, present, bright reality. And I think that sometimes in our lives we find that it's those times in our lives when we've been the most discouraged, only to realize as we look back that those were the very same times in our lives when we were the most disconnected from Jesus himself, from the real Jesus, the living Jesus, the present Jesus. And so whatever we do as we study this book, we should come to know Jesus better. That's the heart of the Father. And the revelation does that for us. It reveals the Son to us in power and glory and authority and as the sovereign ruler of the universe. And as we continue along now, just in verse 1, we're going to see, you know, this is the revelation of the who, and next we get the why it is given to us. Because it's through this revelation of Jesus, it says, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant john so the first thing we see notice that god the father gave the contents of the book to his son that's the him who then gave it to his angel to give to the apostle john who at this point would be about 90 years old now that is a lot of important heavenly hands through which this very important information has come to us through the Apostle John, whom we know is the Apostle whom Jesus loved. We're all familiar with his fourth gospel account, the gospel according to John. That concluded with the, the end of the ministry of Jesus somewhere around A.D. 34. We've seen John active in the early chapters of the book of Acts there in Jerusalem. We know later that John took over the pastoral work in Ephesus, probably just before AD 70, and that would have included oversight of these churches in the surrounding area, which would have been the seven churches of Asia Minor, which we're going to read about in chapters 2 and 3. Now, historically, we know, and as we just saw last time, that it was around this very same time, historically, that Roman Emperor Nero had really begun to persecute the Christians in Rome. And yet, that fiery trial that Peter had promised had not yet really begun, because it wasn't until Domitian became the emperor in about AD 81. That's when the persecution was really intensified. That's when the heat was really turned up because Domitian was as cold blooded a murderer as you will ever meet in the pages of any history. He's the one that really promoted emperor worship. He referred to himself officially as our Lord and God Domitian. He was brutally harsh in his treatment of both Jews and Christians. And so it was following a failed attempt to boil John alive in hot oil. That didn't work. So Domitian then had John sort of banished to this rocky, barren, seemingly God-forsaken island of Patmos. It was basically a Roman penal colony on an island 10 miles long, six miles wide, out in the middle of the Aegean Sea. And yet it was here, on that isolated island, during that isolated time, living in an isolated cave, that's the time when John received these visions that make up the book of Revelation. And isn't that just the way that it always is in our lives as well? Right, Our vision of Jesus is so often clearest when we are stuck and when we feel isolated 
right there in our own Patmos, right? That's when we see him most clearly. That's when our focus is sharpened. That's when our spiritual senses are the most receptive. And truly, the things that we know most deeply about the Lord, they probably weren't learned in Bible school. They probably weren't learned by listening to a podcast. They probably weren't even learned by sitting through even a fantastic sermon like this one. But the things that we know most deeply about the Lord, they were revealed to us by the Lord when we were stuck on our own Patmos. When we were there in the midst of our own tribulations and dealing with our own difficulties, right? When that diagnosis first came back or when those divorce papers first came in or when our business went belly up or this relationship didn't work out or when that child that we love so dearly went astray. But it's then that we see we have the opportunity, right? In that seemingly forsaken island, we have the opportunity whether we're going to slide into spiritual depression or whether we're going to await a fresh revelation from the Lord. And if we look through the entire Bible, what we find is that most every time someone had a fresh vision or that they gained new understanding or that they saw a clear revelation of the Lord, it was received when, like John, they were on their own Patmos. You think about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and David, and the list goes right on all the way up through the New Testament as we've just seen with the Apostle Paul. And so that tribulation that you may be going through even right now, you can trust that it's going to be used by the Lord to accomplish one purpose, and that's to bring you a fuller revelation of Jesus. Right there on Patmos, as it all starts to unfold right before your eyes. And that's just the way that we're going to see it worked here for John, right? He's going to have vision after vision after vision. Next time in verse 9, we're going to see that he's going to be transported forward to the day of the Lord and actually witness these future events taking place. Now, don't ask me how that works. All we know is that physically he was still there on the island of Patmos, but we're going to see that God's going to transport him to heaven and out into the wilderness and up to a high mountain so that he could witness all of these incredible events unfold and then record them for us. Why? Well, not just to glorify God's son, but notice what it says there in verse one, that God wanted to show his servants things that must shortly take place. So the purpose then is to communicate to others, the servants of Jesus, right? That includes each one of us who are tuned in here today to show us those things which are sure to take place in the future. So now, rather than relating past events, rather than relating history as in the four gospels, talking about the first coming of Jesus. So the purpose of the book of Revelation is to reveal these things which will take place immediately before, during, and after the second coming of Jesus. So this is a book full of prophecy. Now, we've pointed out before that not all prophecy is predictive prophecy, but this prophetic book clearly is predictive because it describes, again, those things that must shortly take place. Now that brings us to just kind of a quick consideration on the interpretation of these prophecies. And I just want to take a moment because I think that it's important that we understand exactly where we stand and why it is that we stand there. Now you guys are a smart group and you can handle a few facts every now and then, right? Now, good and godly students of the Bible differ over the meaning of the details of this book. And over the past 2,000 years, there have been four main methods 
of interpretation that people have proposed. The first one of those is the preterist view. It comes from a Latin word that means preter means past. And what this approach holds is that everything in this book already took place during the first century and was completed before A.D. 100. They say that John is detailing the war between the church and Rome, Rome, and that he was writing to the saints to comfort and to encourage them during their time of persecution. And it's absolutely true. This book is encouraging to all saints of all times who are suffering persecution. And yet John himself says seven different times that he's writing prophecy, not that he's recording history. And certainly this book would have special value to those Christians who were enduring Roman persecution, but that value didn't end with the end of the first century. So there, are, I think, are some definite problems with the preterist view. The second view is the historical view. Interpreters in this camp claim to see the fulfillment of all of church history in these symbols in the Revelation. So they believe the book outlines the course of history from apostolic times right up until the end of the age. And what they do is they search history books to find events that parallel the ones that are described in Revelation. And yet sometimes the results of this approach can be a little bit confusing. Seldom do two interpretations interpret a given passage as referring to the same event because each and every interpreter tends to find fulfillment of the specific events in Revelation, well, they find them in events that happened in their own lifetime. So one interpreter might see Luther and the Reformation in a symbol that another interpreter sees with the, the, you know, the invention of the printing press or something like that. And again, the real question to ask when we consider this is, of what value would the revelation be to those believers in John's day if all it was doing was foretelling coming church history? And what value would it be for us today? So seemingly there, I think, are some significant shortcomings with that strictly historical view. Now, the third view is the spiritual or the poetic position. And those students abandon the idea of prophetic prophecy completely. They use Revelation just as a symbol, kind of a presentation of the conflict between Christ and Satan or between good and evil. They reject the idea that John is writing about actual events at all and claim that he's just dealing with spiritual principles that will apply to our personal lives. And yet again, John tells us that he's writing prophecy. And we absolutely would recognize that Revelation does contain so many basic spiritual principles uh, expressed in symbolic forms. We also have to recognize that this book deals with real events that will one day really take place in the real world. And that brings us to the fourth view, which is the futurist position. Now, this school emphasizes that Revelation is prophecy that chapters 6 through 22 describe a very specific scenario of events that will occur on the earth and in heaven after the rapture of the church to heaven. And cer certainly students of the futurist view gladly recognize that there are deep spiritual lessons in the book. They, they see there is historical fulfillment, and we'll see that as we go through it. But we also recognize that it talks about actual events that will be fulfilled one day in the future. So the big question, of course, is which view is the correct one? And the answer, of course, is that in a sense, each one of them is correct in some respect. So the book of Revelation did speak to John's day. It does say something about church history. It does have meaning spiritually to our personal lives. But while there's elements of those first three approaches that do have their place, we can't deny the place of the futurist view. We know that the book of Revelation speaks about clarity for the end times, for two main reasons. First of all, the book of Revelation has to mean something, 
right? This is a book that Jesus gave to show his servants something, something specific. It isn't just a book of meaningless nonsense. And the book of Revelation definitely claims to contain, contain predictive prophecy. Again, it's showing us things that must shortly take place. Now think of it this way. If the book of Revelation isn't intended to be interpreted as future prophecy, then what that means is God never gave to the church any book within the New Testament that explains what happens in the world explains the course of coming events. He never gave us any indication that the church would have victory just as Jesus promised. It never gave us anything that shows us the judgment of sin and most importantly, the, the fulfillment of so many of those prophecies given all throughout the Old Testament scriptures that have yet to be fulfilled. It would be almost like you were watching a movie and suddenly it stopped streaming before the movie was over it's sort of like God saying, well, that's all you get. You know, hope it all works out for you. But that simply wouldn't happen. Instead, Revelation is that book. And any believer who sincerely approaches the text as a prophecy of events that are going to occur is going to be rewarded in our study of it because we're going to have understanding and we're going to have insight into the course of the events that we see happening in the world and better understanding of the forces that are actually shaping them. Some people would say flat out that we shouldn't be concerned at all with prophecy, that it's kind of a pointless exercise. And yet I would say, I would maintain that if God was concerned enough to talk about it, then we should be concerned enough to listen. And I think it's just staggering to just pause for a moment and just to consider that in the pages of this book, written 2,000 years ago, that we are studying events which are sure to occur. Notice John says that these events must take place. Not that they might, not that they may, not that they could take place, but that they must Take place because each one has been sovereignly foreordained by our God. The very same God that it says in Isaiah chapter 46, he said, I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now I know that we're not even through all of verse 1, but already we've seen so clearly the subject of the book, right? This is the book about the glorified Jesus Christ. We've seen the purpose of the book, the why, right? To reveal to the church the events of the future. And now finally, in the rest of verse 1, we're going to see the method or how it is that this information is going to be revealed. Because it says next, again, that this revelation had been given by the Father to the Son, and he says, and he sent and signified it by his angel. So just those simple words, sent and signified, suggest to us that this book will use signs and symbols to convey its message. Signs and symbols which will illustrate spiritual truth. The word signified simply means to show by a sign. And so this is a book of signs. I like to think of it as the angel signified this message to John. And as we study through it, we're going to see that some of the signs and symbols are very clearly explained. Some of them are strategically unexplained. And so many are explained by referring to Old Testament parallels. Because just like the Old Testament books of Daniel and Ezekiel, Revelation extensively uses these symbolic and these figurative forms of writing. And in fact, these symbols have to be interpreted. The fact that they have to be interpreted, that's what's led to so many of these imaginative misinterpretations. And yet as careful students of the word, let me assure you, we don't need to exercise our imaginations 
or our ingenuity to kind of think out the meanings of these symbols. What we do need to do instead is we need to recognize the principle that most every symbol that we will see in Revelation is either explained or clearly alluded to somewhere else in the pages of the Bible. In other words, the simple meaning of this symbolic writing is found by comparing it to previous prophetic or other figurative revelation in the Old Testament. And this is where people so often miss this. This is what leads to those misinterpretations because the New Testament book of Revelation is deeply rooted right in the pages of the Old Testament. And it's impossible to understand this book without referring repeatedly back to those Old Testament scriptures. Did you know that out of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, 278 of them contain clear references to the Old Testament? That's almost 70%. And somebody figured out that there are actually altogether over 500 different prophetic allusions to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. Allusions to Psalms and Daniel, Zechariah, Genesis, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel being amongst the most often referred. We've seen before that all of the scriptures are so beautifully intertwined, and yet I think what we're going to see is that nowhere do we see the same kind of internal consistency that we're going to see here in the book of Revelation. As we see this figurative and this symbolic language pulled directly from the pages of other scriptures. And so the question we have to ask is why use this kind of language at all? Why not just write what you mean? Well, quickly, there's a number of reasons why many believe that this symbolic language was used. First of all, the signs were necessary because John is expressing the things of heaven. And remember, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said that what he had heard, he had heard with inexpressible words. So John describes the things that he is seeing, but he can only use these symbolic images to describe them. Remember, to us, this book is prophecy, but John was simply recording the things that he was watching unfold before him. And what he saw so often went so far beyond what words could describe. So we suspect also that the use of these signs would have been necessary, not just to convey information about heaven, but also to provide protection. Because understand, at the time of this writing, we have this terrible wave of persecution against the church, and this letter likely was written initially in such a way that it would make no sense to the enemy if they got their hands on a copy of it. And yet to believers who were familiar and were students of the Old Testament scriptures, those images would have been easily understood and what John was communicating would have been clearly comprehended. So these signs would have provided a description of things. It would have provided protection. And it also would most clearly convey the information. Keep in mind, language changes over time. Just for instance, anyone, anyone of, of us who've read or used the, the original King James translation of the Bible, we see that so many of those archaic words or phrases just aren't even understood today. And yet pictures, symbols, those things stay the same. Those things are cross-generational and they're cross-cultural and they very often can convey more clearly what the writer's actually trying to to communicate. So whether it's expressing the things of heaven or providing protection or clearly conveying information, one of the other reasons that this figurative language could be used is simply to arouse emotion because it, they convey these powerful images that are impossible to forget. We'll see that, you know, a world political leader is described as a beast. Right? A commercial system becomes Babylon, the whore. 
Christians are described as the bride of Christ. And each of these figures really prompts a powerful image in the minds and the heart of the readers. Each of these things, these symbols and images speak to a reality. We're going to see, you know, it's one thing to, to call something evil or to call something bad, but it's far more vivid to describe the image of a woman drunk with the blood of the saints. Right, we'll see next week this picture of Jesus. It may or may not be literal, but each of the things that we see, the symbols that are described, each one conveys a very specific spiritual truth about him. So remember, the word revelation means unveiling. So instead of being some sort of collection of puzzling prophecies, the book of Revelation is a reasonable, orderly unveiling of Jesus, of his final victory over sin and over Satan and over the world system, and these powerful images and signs and symbols are the method. All of these things we see were recorded by John, it says in verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ and to all the things that he saw. So John faithfully described the things he saw that are recorded for us here as the word of God, right? as the testimony of Jesus. He knew that this was a communication from and it was all about Jesus himself. He knew that this book was the Holy Scriptures. He knew that it was the word of God and that it contained a revelation from God. And I think what's important for us to notice here is that all of this was entrusted to John because it says there that he bore witness to the things that God showed him. In his first letter to the church, he said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard and which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And I think this is so important because so often the Lord's purpose, and sometimes even kind of his prerequisite for revealing to us information or inspiration the purpose is that we initially would receive it into our own hearts but then also that we would share it freely with others remember back in genesis 18 we just read about it in our read through the bible god warned abraham about this coming judgment upon sodom because he knew that abraham would do something that he would act on that information in Mark chapter 4, Jesus said, you know, take heed what you hear with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you and to you who hear, he said, more will be given. And so we always need to come to the Lord, not with an attitude of give me or, or entertain me, Lord, or, you know, show me something new, but we need to come to the Lord with the hope that we can receive something that we can then give away and freely minister it to another. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. And sometimes you'll find that people who say, you know, I just don't seem to be growing in the Lord. You know, I don't know what's, what's wrong. Sometimes it's those people, they need to understand, again, that revelation and information, inspiration, the more freely we give it out, the more freely the Lord will replenish it. So the question to ask is, are we really looking to personally receive from the Lord into our hearts so that we can release that back out to bless someone else? See, there's a principle, there's a pattern here of this divine revelation. God the Father gave the contents to Jesus, who gave it to his angel, who gave it to John. The word there for angel Interestingly, you could translate simply as messenger. And I think that's important because all of us, we are all considered messengers for the Lord. 
right, to take this information that we've been given and then to pass it along to others, to take that testimony of Jesus and of his work in our lives and pass it along to others so that they also could know that same kind of a powerful transformation, right? We're to bear witness and to bless others in the same way that we've been blessed. Because look at what it is that John records for us in our final verse here. He said, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. And this is where it really gets good, right? Because in just our three verse prologue, here it concludes with a blessing on each and every individual who reads this book, as well as on those who hear it, as well on the, on those who take to heart the things that are written in it. All right, those of us who hear it with really attentive hearts. And you'll see that as we embark on this journey through the book of Revelation, we are about to be blessed. Because did you know that of the 66 books that make up the Bible, this book alone has this unique promise attached to it this promise of blessing. Think about how blessed you've been by so many of the other books as you've read or studied through them on your own. This one comes with a money-back guarantee, right, of blessing from the Lord. And what's so unfortunate is that there are so many who shy away from this book and therefore they miss out on the blessing. Do you know that there are entire denominations who virtually omit the book of Revelation in their regular schedule of readings, both for public worship and also just for private devotions. And this has kind of become a, a typical attitude of much of the professing church toward the book, so that much of the church believes that only fanatics within the church would really want to dig into this book at all. So I guess that kind of maybe clears up where it is that we stand, right, in the scheme of things. We are those fanatics. But the truth is that this book is a, uh, you know, is a blessing for anyone who wants to be blessed. But mark this, too, because what this verse tells us is that Revelation isn't just a book that you study through with some sort of idle curiosity about its prophecies, that these words need to be, what does it say, kept. They need to be hidden in our hearts. Because what we always need to bear in mind as we read it is that this book was originally given not to believers in the first century who were trying to figure out the nuances of eschatology, right? But because they were watching their brothers and sisters dying as a result of this inconceivable persecution. So right when this book was given, you have an entire church that's crying out, where is the Lord? You know, we believe in him. We've given our lives to him. But what in the world is happening? They won't even let us gather indoors, right? <laughs> what they needed... They needed a revelation of Jesus Christ to be reminded that Jesus Christ is in control and that he is on the throne. And so this message coming from John would have provided them with such great comfort to their hearts, but only if they would keep it in their hearts. See, the overarching theme of this book is that Jesus Christ is on the throne that he is in control, that things are going according to plan, and that he is coming back. You know, much more than just random information for kind of prophetic speculation, it gives us truths that we need to hide deeply in our hearts. And if we'll do that, then the book of Revelation will change the way we live. And I think you'll find as we study through these chapters, this is actually an intensely practical book. 
And here we're given this promise of blessing for those who keep the things that we are going to see revealed. Keep the reality of this revelation near at hand and let it influence and let it enlighten our perspective on all that we see happening around us and all the things that are happening to us. Because, as John concludes here, he says the time is near. Now, just as we finish up, that phrase is near, or when he said it's shortly coming to pass in verse 1, those phrases have created much controversy, right? Much contention, and many have incorrectly interpreted them to mean that the prophecies should have been fulfilled right away in John's day. And yet, if we look at the actual words that were used in the original language, we get a very different picture. The picture is more so that it will be sudden when it comes. Not necessarily that the fulfillment will come immediately, but it talks about how swiftly time is going to begin to transpire once these prophecies begin to finally be fulfilled. So that Greek word there shortly is on tachiai, and literally it renders as it must come to pass with rapidity. It's the same Greek word that we get tachometer from, which of course use, you know, measures the, the revolutions of an engine. Think about this. If you were going to set out from here and drive down to LA, maybe take 101 or something, right? You might see one sign for LA, you know, as you get kind of out of the Bay Area for the first few hours, maybe. But then as you get further south, those signs for LA would become more and more frequent. By the time you get down to maybe Ventura, you're going to start seeing them very frequently until suddenly, boom, before you know it, you're in LA. So the idea is that when these end time events begin to happen, the idea is that the RPMs are going to start to increase, the engine's really going to start to rev up, and things are going to start to happen really fast. Once they start to occur, they're going to occur in rapid succession. And this goes exactly with what Jesus promised in Luke chapter 18. He said, shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth? So today, a long-suffering God is still giving sinners a chance to repent. Because as it says in Second Peter, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But when the time does come for judgment to finally come, we can be assured there will be no delay. Also remember that short and near are very relative terms in terms of God's timetable as compared to man's. Right? For 2,000 years, we've been on the brink of the conclusion of all of these things. It's almost as though we're kind of running parallel to the edge, but we're not running towards that distant drop yet. But the book of Revelation is going to outline God's program for all of human history and what began you know, ages ago in the first creation, ultimately we're going to see completed in the new creation. It's going to show us what we've all heard so well said, that history is his story, right? Human affairs are in the hands of our victorious Savior. And my hope is that as we study through this book, that we would be encouraged and that we would be enlightened with a fresh understanding, that we be enlightened with a fresh sense of hope for the future and a fresh sense of confidence in the one who holds it. So let's pray. So Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. We thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for helping us, Lord, uh, to simply 
uh, finish up, Lord, looking at your word. Father, we pray that you would help just to remove all the distractions from this morning, Lord, and that by your spirit, that you would just, um, that these truths would penetrate our hearts, Lord, that they'd prepare our hearts for what we're going to see as we study through the rest of this fantastic book. So, Father, we thank you for today. We pray, pray your blessing, Lord, on the rest of the day, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. O oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Amen. God bless you guys. Um, keep praying this week. Keep resting in the Lord. Keep looking for that fresh revelation of Jesus, even if you're stuck right now uh, on Patmos. So God bless you guys. Uh, we'll see you Wednesday night for uh, regroup, or we'll see you back here Sunday. And I think we're going to have some more worship as long as uh, everything holds together. So God bless you guys.